So today is session one of two sessions um, in a training webinar on Oasis XDISP. So the objectives of today are to introduce you to the method methodology in XDISP. Um, so how does the program work? I'm going to also go through a case study of how XDISP is being used in industry. I'm going to set up an analysis live for you. Um, and also introduce you to shortcuts and tips um, through my setup and also in the presentation. So in terms of what XDISP is, um, XDISP means excavation displacement. Um, we have another program called PDISP, which is pressure displacement, and both of these programs can be combined. XDISP calculates ground movements due to excavations, um, typically for tunnel excavations and soft ground. Um, shaf shafts and retain cuts, um, and also mined excavation. So you can deal with any one of those or a combination um, of them. XDISP, um, XDISP has been developed extensively um, and it is used heavily on major projects around the world. So we've developed an advanced version of XDISP as well called XDISP Pro. It does everything that the normal version of XDISP would do but it allows you to deal with stage construction that might be important to you if you're um, dealing with basements and tunnels in stages and looking at um, settlements as they advance. It, um, it can deal with automation, so it has a COM feature and that's important for some clients who have BIM requirements. And it also um, has bulk chart ex exports, so um, in some of the files that I've had a look at, there are hundreds of assets and nearing a thousand in, in, in one or two cases. So the bulk chart ex export helps organize this um, for customers and clients. So in terms of the analysis methods, um, we deal with tunnel induced ground movements, excavation induced ground movements and mining induced ground movements. And I'm going to go through that in much more detail with you today. So we're going to start with the tunnel ground movements. So um, we look at the empirical methods um, for tunnels in XDISP. So the equations for the curves are generated from the normal or Gaussian distribution. The normal distribution relationship actually shows a close match to tunneling induced case study movements at ground and subsurface. And there are a number of papers which actually show that it can sometimes be difficult to achieve similar results using 3DFE. So I've cited the Adam Brooks and Potts paper here, but um, there are a number of others. So if you imagine the crown of the tunnel here, the movements above the tunnel, tunnel take this kind of normal distribution here. And this is the kind of movements that you get as you advance the tunnel along, just to give you an idea of what to expect. So because it's empirically based, um, the actual inputs are much simpler than thinking about 3D FE. So there are two main inputs that you have to think for, for your tunnel, uh, you have to derive for your tunnel. One is the volume loss, which is based on um, tunnel inputs. So for example, what kind of tunnel boring machine are you using? Um, you know, what's the depth of your tunnel, various other things. And the trough width parameter, which is a representation of the soil. So when I go through this in a few seconds, you'll understand it a little bit better. But effectively, you get the complete three-dimensional behavior of the ground due to tunneling from very few parameters. So it's much easier to check um, and easier to be confident in. So um, the first parameter we discussed was volume loss. So volume loss is the ratio of the additional volume of excavated ground over the theoretical volume of the tunnel. Um, there are there is guidance. I've put some of the Macklin paper in there, but there are there is a number of guidance on the kind of volume loss parameters you might want to input. They do depend on a number of factors. So tunneling methods I mentioned, but uh, the ground and groundwater conditions, the flexibility of the lining sometimes the depth of the tunneling, even the speed that the lining is erected. But here's a set of examples of um, some volume loss parameters that were used um, in um, some projects in London, um, in London Clay and in the Lambeth Group. Interestingly, you'll see that actually um, the engineers used variable values for volume loss, and it really depended on um, what kind of you know, um, what the contractor was willing to sign up to in terms of risk. So um, case study data gave us um, the observed ground movement and the volume loss values. 
um, and the contractors would discuss what kind of level of certainty they were looking for and on that basis the volume loss was decided upon. So as you can see it's, it's, it's quite variable in terms of what it can do. So in terms of trough width parameter, a uh, trough width parameter is based on the soil type. You could input in this in yourself and I've given you some typical values here. So for clay we're looking at 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 and it drops down to around 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 for granular soils um, above the water table. So just to give you an idea of how the trough width parameter affects the settlements, um, for a low trough width parameter for sand, you'll get a higher settlement directly above the tunnel, but as you go further away from the tunnel, clays will give you a slightly higher settlement, even though they have a lower maximum settlement directly above the tunnel. The tunnel. So um, just to give you an idea of how it works in the soils. So that was the tunneling theory. Um, I've actually missed a slide here. So um, in terms of trough width parameter, um, I gave you the specific values for K um, for different types of soils, but there are publications um, for surface trough width parameters, which are helpful, which is the O'Reilly and New Papers um, for surface displacements and multi-layer deposits and Boscarden. So I suggest you have a look at those as well. If you're interested in um, displacements below the surface, um, Mayer et al. gives you good predictions for clay and Neuenbauer's also gives predictions for different types of soil. So these are all papers that I suggest you have a look at um, if you're thinking of inputting trough width parameter. Right, so in terms of surface displacement and um, excavations, so we've covered now the tunnel displacements, and now we're looking at a separate type of theory, which is the theory that we have for um, excavations, for basements and shafts. So we um, get surface displacements out, um, which are the displacements right at the top, um, where the top of the excavation might be, and the surface of the soil. And we, ha we have actually inputted, or we have um, the curves from Sirius C760, typically for stiff clay, um, incorporated into the program but you can also input curves yourself um, for surface displacements. Um, there's a lot of empirical data out there. Uh, I think I'm aware of one or two API papers as well, but um, different types of soils will have different surface um, movement curves for um, different excavations. And uh, you, know, you can have a look at that, um, or you might have site data or site readings that you might want to use. The displacements below ground um, are only relevant if you're um, interested, for example, if you have a utility um, below the ground or you're looking at um, predicting for a displacement, uh, for a basement, um, maybe a nearby building below the ground. But for the displacement below the ground, initially what XDISP offered was we have the surface displacement and it drops down to zero. Uh, but a lot of studies have been done on that and we found that this wasn't actually a realistic way of representing um, uh, settlements. And the reason it's not a realistic way of representing settlement is, is you actually have this peak of movement at the base of your excavation. So with that peak of movement, you are actually under predicting settlement if you, for example, you had a utility here or you had another basement close by. So it's important to be aware of this. So for that reason, we allow users to input in their own subsurface curves. And I'm going to have to show you how to do this live today. The subsurface curves can be derived from finite element analysis, or it can be um, derived from excavations in similar soils. So if you have site readings, or alternatively, if you've got papers, um, it'll um, you can use any of those methods to derive those um, properties. There is detailed methods included in our training materials and on our website. So if anybody's interested, please pop me an email um, and I can help you with that. So another thing worth mentioning for um, excavation methods is corner stiffening. So um, if you have a, an excavation, on the corner of the excavation, you basically have a simple arc of movement. But what happens is you're over predicting this particular settlement here because um, you're not considering corner stiffening effects. So a paper was done by Fuentes and Deverint 
which so shows that there are corner stiffening effects. Um, I'm going to go through that briefly as well in the next couple of slides. But um, effectively, what XDIS does, it, it calculates the distance, um, the D value, and it has uh, standard values for P1 and P2, uh, which has which has basically been, basically been calibrated with case histories. So the corner stiffness is effectively aut almost automated for you. So just if you're interested, these are the case histories that we used um, generally in clay soils, um, if you note here. And something that you might find interesting is that the ratio of movements in the corner um, and at the 100% section seem to be approximately independent of settlement, retained height, ground conditions and the propping system. So therefore, those P1 and P2 values seem to be seem to be pretty uniform throughout. So finally, um, I mentioned the mining induced ground movements. Um, I'm not going to be demonstrating that today, but that is an option within XDISP. It calculates the surface displacements due to mine um, due to mines, and that's um, using the method proposed by Renatal. So I know it's been used in a um, number of projects. Um, I used it myself once or twice in Yorkshire. So it it, it is a feature that's been used. So um, we've now gone through the basic theory of um, tunneling, um, excavation, and mines. In terms of inputting into XDISP, um, you need to tell the analysis program what type of analysis you're doing, so the problem type. It's important before you actually set up something in XDISP, you have an idea of what you want to calculate. Um, so do you want to calculate displacements along lines, you know, where utilities might sit, where buildings might sit? Um, do you want to calculate displacements just generally along a grid so that you get um, you get some contours? Or are you just interested in one or two points? Then we need to input the tunnel data, which I kind of briefly went through um, just now, and also the excavation data. So what's the geometry of your excavation um, and a little bit about the actual um, displacement curves. Mines, if you're um, using the mining um, problem type. And buildings, utilities and tunnels for the building, utility and tunnels um, assessments. And um, just to mention here, the buildings, utilities and tunnels also sit on your displacement lines. So um, just if you're planning ahead and you know that you're going to have to do a building and utility and tunnel assessment, you might want to put displacement lines at those points. So just to give you an idea, the way um, XDIS works is similar to many other OASIS programs. So we have a gateway that we go through. And when I go into the program, it'll become much more obvious and what I'm talking about. We have the displacement da the data, which is generally input in through tables, which are accessible through the gateway. We have um, a plan view and a 3D graphics view, which I think is really useful to view throughout your inputting process because it helps you make sure that you've put things in um, as it should be. Um, and you get a tabular output so you can export this to Excel and um, you know you can do further analysis on it. So that's all very helpful. So um, just before I go into the program, here's a couple of um, things I just want to share with you. So um, the gray the gray um, boxes at the top of the tables are uh, what we call the default cells. And if you keep on inputting um, the same values um, for, um, say, for example, for K value for tunnel every time, if you put the gray K value in at the top and tab through it, you will always get that value. So I'll show you when we go into the program, it'll become a little bit more obvious. Another useful feature, especially when you're dealing with things like displacement lines and grids, is the equals and the equals equals. It copies the cells in the line above. Um, if you've got a really big table, and I have seen sometimes, you know, hundreds um, of, you know, of rows, um, you can you can navigate through long tables using the Control G feature, and right click brings up a whole list of options. So I know that. Um, one or two of our users have um, sometimes input in values incorrectly by a factor um, and therefore they were able to modify that and use that. So there are useful features in there when you play around with things. 
So in terms of the output, um, we have the 3D graphics output. We would have the plan view as well. Um, but we also get the line graphs, which give the different types of um, settlement and displacement. And we have the building damage interaction charts as well. So I'm not going to go through building damage specifically today. But at the end of the month, please do attend. And we can find out much more about that later. So uh, just before I go into the program, a couple of tips that I really like is that, um, you know, you are the main tester of the software. So check your results often, um, you know, have a look at the graphical outputs and um, have a look at the tabular outputs and examine it carefully. Um, I'm going to show you today the manual. Um, so we are going to be having a look at the manual. Um, study the bits that you don't understand well, because it's really important you appreciate the theory um, before um, you know, you go ahead with using the program. So um, just a case study um, to help you understand how it's being used in industry. Um, this case study is taken um, from the Copenhagen Metro and was given to us by some colleagues um, in Arab. So the Copenhagen Metro is a 15.5 kilometer long metro line. The stations are constructed as a cut and cover structure um, and you've got the tunnels underneath. Interestingly, um, the buildings were on wooden piles, so they're quite sensitive to movement, which is why, you know, they had strict requirements on um, settlement prediction and building damage. So Oasis Exodus was used to calculate the settlements of the ground surface caused by the construction of the tunnels. So the way the program was used was that um, there was a grid put at the top and that was used for screening. So where settlements exceeded more than five millimeters or the predicted slope was more in what than one in 500, for those buildings, the ex um, Exodus was able to show how the structures performed in relation to damage categories by carrying out a specific building damage interaction. So again, I'm going to go through this in much more detail at the end of the month, so it'll be a bit, become a bit more obvious to you. But when I create a displacement grid today and set out the contours, you can at least see how you can pick out areas where displacement is more than 5 mil and possibly also where it's more than, oh, than a 1 in 500 mil slope. Right, so for the demonstration, um, I'm going to input displacement lines and grids. I'm going to input tunnels and excavations. And I'm going to input subsurface displacement curves. And then we're going to run the analysis, export tabular results, plot the graphs, and manipulate 3D graphics. So we're going to do a couple of things um, in this demonstration. So I better start off on the program. Right, so I just um, opened XDisp here, so um, everybody should be able to see um, uh, XDisp here. So this is the welcome screen when you open up a, a, a new, um, uh, when you open up um, XDisp at the start. So if I click about, it tells me which build I'm using and which version of XDisp I'm using. Um, it's really important that you try and use the most up-to-date build where possible. Um, uh, and the reason for that is we update um, and fix the software very regularly. So do check that. And if you are sending in a support query to us, it's very helpful for us to know what version you're using and what build you're on. Uh, you can also click to the home page from here. So I'm going to do that because I think it's important for you guys to see what's going on here. So um, we have the home page, which gives you an overview view of the program. But if you go to support here, um, we have tutorials that you can watch. Um, you can download the tutorial manual from here um, and you can have a look at um, look at all of that there. The FAQs are also very handy. So um, I often find it's useful to have a look at this um, and see what um, general problems or general questions other people do have um, and how, you know, uh, that helps you understand the software much better. So going back into the program, I'm going to say I want to create a new file. Okay. So I'm going to look at the Input Explorer here, start with the titles. So it is important to fill your titles in. And the reason it is important, because when you print out um, uh, a graph or the tabulated output, all the information in, um, in, this, in the titles will come on your printed output. So I've just put in some basic uh, information there. So OK. 
right? Um, units, so I'm working um, in SI units, but you can, there are a number of options for you there in terms of units. Problem type, um, today I'm going to demonstrate to you a tunnel and embedded wall excavation example. So we'll start by putting in the displacement data. So where do I want to analyze um, this specific problem? So I'm going to start by inputting a grid. But before I do that, I want to show you um, what I mean by a grid. So a grid is basically a number of points where we calculate displacements. Generally, you would have a grid at the surface. Um, you don't want your grid to be too fine because it would take a long time to calculate. But at the same time, if it's too loose or if it's not fine enough, um, it will be difficult for you to accurately calculate settlements. So you need to have an idea of what you want um, in terms of grids there. So um, there are two, there, are, there is a, a certain way to input grids in Oasis XDisp. We have what we call the global Y and the global X direction. Um, and what we mean by that is that if I'm extruding, uh, if I'm trying to represent this grid in the global Y, I would draw this line across here Along, going along the x-axis effectively, and then um, it would extrude in the y direction. If I'm drawing a grid in um, the global x direction, and I can draw the, draw the same grid, I draw a line down here along the y-axis, and then again it extrudes in the x. And the reason that this system has been set up because it is because you can actually also draw a grid in the global Z direction, which means I can draw a line and I can extrude it into the screen and effectively have um, a contour grid that goes down um, into the screen or down in the Z direction or up, whichever way you want to represent it. So um, when I go and input it now, it should be a little bit more obvious. But if you just rem try and remember this image, what we have is we have a line going across in the y direction and we're extruding, uh, sorry, in uh, across the x-axis and we're extruding up in the y direction. OK, so let's go back into the program. So let's input in the grids. So I'm going to press tab here and you can see that automatically um, uses the defaults from the top. I'm going to say the global Y. So that's the line I drew along. So I'm now going to draw that red line. Okay, so the red, red line started at 10, 0, and the Z level in this problem is 100. So 100 meters OD. And then um, it finishes at 200. The Y value is the same, so it's constant, so it's grayed out. And the Z level is again 100. Now, the number of intervals I'm going to set here is 57. Um, this is actually in line with the tutorial manual because I've taken this out from the tutorial manual. And I think it's a useful example for you, you because you can replicate it using our online tutorial manual. Uh, the distance for extrusion. So this is where that y, that line goes up um, along the y-axis is um, 110. The intervals here are 33. Um, the surface is at 100 meters, so yes, it's a surface. Um, uh, surf we need the surface calculation for tunnels, and we want this calculated. So now I'm going to use one of those shortcuts to copy this grid above. So I'm going to go equals equals, and that copies nicely. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to call this grid 2, and I'm going to have a grid 10 meters below my surface grid. So this is actually a subsurface grid now. So this will give me an idea of um, displacements that are happening below the surface. So I'm going to say subsurface here, right. So um, as a point of good practice, I'm going to save this file. So we've now saved that, um, and we have uh, two grids in there. So um, Again, another point of good practice is to check that uh, our inputs are correct. So if I look at my graphical input, I can see two grids there, and it looks like it's along the right direction. So if I have a look at it like that, that's what I'm. That's what I was kind of hoping for, and it looks, you know, fine enough for me in that particular case. So that's great. So now it's time to input in um, displacement lines. Another useful feature that I wanted to demonstrate to you was that you can copy and paste um, into these tables. So for example, if you're creating multiple files with um, similar 
uh, similar displacement lines or similar grids or uh, anything else that you want to copy and paste, you can do that using um, use it straight from Excel. So um, here's one I've done earlier. So I've got a number of displacement lines in there now. So if I just check that, you can just about see the displacement lines. But if I right click and go to settings wizard, you can also get settings wizard from this icon up here. I'm going to just, just switch off the grid so I can see. Yeah, so those lines are looking the way I would want them to. Okay, so that's um, so that's fine. So I've put my displacement data in there. There are options for points, and there are also options for polylines. If you have curved displacement my lines, maybe it's you know sitting along a utility that you're interested in, for example. So uh, another thing that's worth noting for the graphical input um, that I should mention is that you can also import DXFs and look at them um, as gray lines, and that might be helpful if you're trying to kind of orient yourself in this particular kind of, you know, 3D graphics interface. So that is an option for you as well. Right, so I think we're ready to input the tunnels in now that we have the displacement data. Right, so I do have, again, the tunnels, um, which I can copy and paste and then explain to you how I'm getting the values that I'm getting. Right, so for this tunnel, uh, we've got a diameter of 6.5 meters. Uh, we're running here um, from these x to y values. We've got the ground loss that I talked about um, earlier in the presentation. Um, I'm inputting a k value directly of 0 0.5. Um, so if you've got a really good memory, you'll remember that that was the clay value. So um, I'm using a clay and therefore a Maritel, which is again applicable for use more in clays. Um, is the best analysis for subsurface displacement calculations. And um, as I mentioned previously, for this particular problem, the ground levels at 100. So that's a tunnel input, which is um, pretty simple. So for embedded wall excavations, um, as I mentioned, we've got ground movement curves um, input for your embedded wall excavations from Syria C760 and Syria C580 for clays. But that doesn't give subsurface movements. Um, so there are two ways you could um, input subsurface movements. One is that you could basically take your surface uh, movement curves and say that that just you know extrudes directly down. But that's going to be an over prediction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a subsurface curve. This subsurface curve could have come from an FE analysis. Uh, it could come from empirical data or site reading. So. So I selected new, um, and now it's given me the option to name the um, subsurface curve. So I'm going to say OK, and I'm going to input the data from this, again, by copying and pasting. So um, if I check, I think it was a horizontal. Yes, it was horizontal. So let me find. So this is a normalized curve. Um, so actually, it will work for any depth of excavation. So you don't need a separate curve for separate um, excavations, but you do probably need separate curves if you're working in very different types of soil in one analysis file. Oh, sorry, I didn't, co I didn't copy and paste properly. Okay, copy. And if we go to this, if I paste it, yeah, that's pasted fine. So if I apply this, it saved the curve and you can actually view the graph as well. So this gives you kind of an idea of the normalized settlements. Yeah. So now let's put in the vertical graph. Um, so I'm going to again go for new. Vertical sub surface. I'm going to say okay on that um, and let's go and go and copy and paste
Okay, so um, I'm going to click on apply um, because if you input all of that and close this, it just goes. Um, so we now have, um, if you look down, your curve is added to the list of curves and that's saved as well in the program. Okay, so now we're ready to input the excavation. Um, if you have a shaft, you can input a circular shaft in there, but I'm, I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to start off with the polygonal excavation. Um, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to put a rectangle in there, but you can actually put a number of different types of um, polygons in there. But if it does have an internal angle of more than 180 degrees, um, you do get re-entering corners, which can be um, a little bit of a problem. But I will discuss that in detail soon. So um, I'm just going to call this um, excavation one. Right. So the surface it is at 100 meters. And yes, it's going to contribute positively. So. Arc enabled, yes. I'm going to talk to you about what arc enabled is. Um, and I did speak about corner stiffening as well. So we're not applying corner stiffening. But if you did put yes, then it would automatically calculate your D value for you. And as I mentioned, P1 and P2 um, are geometric values. So they're generally 67 and 25 based on the case studies from the Raul and Fuentes paper. So that's uh, 90 and 80 using the defaults again above. And you can, as you can see here, you can see um, your excavation in terms of the points you're inputting. So the base of my excavation is at 85 meters. So it's a 15 meter deep. Right, so that's ready now. So um, if you look, you can see that excavation there. I'm going to click on OK. And let's check on the graphical input that it is what what I was hoping for. Yeah, that looks about right. I'm quite happy with that. Now, before I actually go and run the full analysis, I just want to go through um, one or two things I discussed with regards to excavations with you. So if I click on help here, um, the help um, file comes up. Um, so I'm going to open the help PDF. So um, from the help file. Um, this is our user manual. There's analysis methods. And if we go to embedded wall um, excavation method, we can have a look at the theory on corner stiffening and various other things. So this is the theory on corner stiffening, which I mentioned, and there's a lot of detail in there for you. Um, there's also information about stepped bases. So what this means is that <clears throat> if you have two excavations next to each other, but they have their bases are at different levels, you have to input two independent excavations and combine them. So as you can see here, there are two boxes representing these two excavations. And so the ma manual goes through how best to input this in. I also mentioned um, what arc enabled was. So for example, if you have this bulb, of settlement here and if you join an excavation here you'll have an excess of settlement in this corner so by um, not having the arcs enabled <clears throat> you can actually um, avoid some of that settlement so it's a little bit of a, a hack to kind of combine settlements which is there another thing that i also mentioned was re-entrant corners so that's very important um, for excavations that are where internal angles are greater than 180 degrees um, Exodus wouldn't be able to calculate um, the settlement in that specific region where the angle is greater than 180 degrees. So it's in a small region, but just be aware of it and read about it if you do have that specific um, problem. So I'm going to save this. And I think we're ready to run the analysis. So if you notice, I was using the icons up here. Um, this is the wizard. Um, um, this is analyze here. And I'm going to use the other icons um, as we go along through the problem. Pro program so okay so everything worked well that's fantastic and let's click OK right so we have all the text results here so for example if I wanted um, to look at the displacement line data um, I can look at each displacement line separately or all of every, all of it together and I can actually export this so I can export this into a CSV or I can right click um, and look at the grid view, and then I can copy and paste it into Excel. So there are a number of options there for your tabular outputs. 
but um, it's very important to get your bearings and understand what's happening um, when you're running an, anal an analysis like this. So um, having a look at the grids um, is really helpful. Ah. I can immediately see that I've made a mistake. So this is the problem with these live um, sessions. So um, I haven't switched on um, the curves for uh, my excavation. So why don't we go back into the excavation and have a look? Okay, so in the Input Explorer, when I went to polygonal excavations, um, I put in the um, values for my uh, excavation and I said whether it was arc enabled or stiffened but I didn't assign ground movement curves to it. So I'm going to assign the ground movement curves that I created, the subsurface ones. And if I right click on this now, I can set all to the same because all of my points and all of the lines are going to have the same displacement curves. And I'm going to do this here as well. So we'll go for horizontal subsurface. set all to this and say okay brilliant so now we are ready to analyze and this should all work just fine okay so let's have a look at this and see so there you go um, we're getting the displacements that we are absolutely expecting there uh, which is great to see right so um, this is the displacement for grid one so if you remember grid one was the surface curve if I go down uh, at grid two, level 90 meters here, the displacements drop, which is what you would expect. If I go back to the contours, I can actually annotate and get values. So that gives me um, the displacement at that point um, at level 90. Um, I can also pick up charts here. So I might be interested in this particular line. I'll switch the annotation off. Click on this chart and it gives me the displacement along that line. And actually, I can have a look here and, and move to different lines, or I can use a plan view to um, pick out the lines, again, using um, the line value here. Right, OK, so um, that was, I think, everything I wanted to cover in the plan view. Um, in terms of the line graphs, um, you know, we've got smoothing out effects now in the new version of XDisp. So that's really helpful, especially if you put a grid in there. But just be aware um, that with line graphs, it's important to have enough points along the line to pick up those displacements that are important. And it's important to have the grids fine enough here. So if I didn't have um, if, if I wanted to examine a certain area here, it might be important to maybe put a finer grid to get more detail on displacements as well. So I'll show you how to do that in a second too. So um, finally, before I show you um, the graphical input feature, I'm just going to have a look at the 3D graphics and play around with this to show you the kind of options that you have. Um, a lot of our users comment on how useful this feature is in terms of inputting into presentations and um, and report. So I'm, I think it's worthwhile just going through in a little bit more detail. So I want to switch on the grids now and let's have a look at some um, displacement results. So if I switch off the nodes um, and put in some contours, you can actually choose the contour values as well and change it from here. But I'm going to say OK to this. And as you can see, you can have a look at this graphically, which is really handy. OK, um, another thing that's worth having a look at in the settings wizard is um, we can look at deflected shapes as well. So um, say I want to switch this off and have a look at the deflected shape, maybe of just the top grid, let's say, because otherwise it gets um, quite busy. This just gives us an idea of what's happening in relation to our our tunnel and excavation. Um, it's obviously exaggerated along the Z direction. But if for some reason you were expecting a bigger displacement along the tunnel, then at least you can pick up on this quickly um, and do a quick check of your inputs and see that everything's working in the way that it should. The displacement, the number of different displacement uh, results that you can show here, um, which are all very useful. Um, and there are a number of different ways that you can change and play around with the graphical outputs, which are again handy. And while we're on the point of checking, um, one thing that might be useful for me to point out is the charts 
um, uh, options as well. So as well as you know being able to save the chart images and play around with um, actually your chart the way your chart outputs work, I actually quite like using the coordinates um, and values uh, of the nearest point. Um, so if I, for example, click on coordinates of nearest point and go here, I know that I'm getting this particular displacement um, uh, along these ordinates. So it just gives me an idea of where maximum displacements might lie or minimum. If just if you're asked in the middle of a meeting and you need to get something out quickly, it's always a helpful feature. Right, so I think that covers everything in terms of tips and tricks and, and ways to um, go around your tabular outputs, um, your plan, your 3D outputs, and um, the displacement chart data. But if you remember, I was interested in, in getting some more detailed displacements out maybe around this corner. So um, if I delete the displacements, I'll quickly show you um, if I delete my results, so I just clicked on there to delete results so I can make changes. I'll quickly show you how you can quickly um, input something like a grid in graphically. So um, there is a graphical input option here. So you need to click on the input output icon here. So I'm going to click on that. And as you can see, this grid seems to be um, in the wrong place. So um, I'm going to try and add a displacement grid. Okay, let's see whether this works. So we need to change the definition of our grid first. So I'm going to put in a new grid. And I'm going to change a grid plane. And the grid has to be at 100 meters because that's our surface level. And the grid layout, that's fine. So this just gives us how fine our grid should be. So that's OK. OK, so that's moved our grid right up. So now if I press on Z, I can see this here. Um, and I'm going to add a displacement grid, switch that on. Um, and let's say I wanted a fine grid around here. So I'm going to put that on now. And this automates the whole process of what we did um, in grid inputs there. So I want just to quickly view um, something. I want a fine grid in that corner. And I'm going to put more intervals in there. It's only a surface grid, and I want it calculated, so I'm going to say OK. And I'm going to run this analysis. Let me just check and see that that's input. Yeah, that's fine. So let's run this analysis again and see. OK. That's just saying in a specific area that the results are zero, so um, nothing to panic about. So if I go to plan, and if I look at the grid results, let's have a look and see whether I got my fine grid. Yes, I did. So I can actually, I can actually zoom in now and have a look at the displacements in much more definition and detail, which is really helpful. So as you can see, in like you know, if you're in the middle of looking at something and you know somebody wants to check something, you can actually use the graphical input feature really quickly and really easily. You could do this with a line. Um, you can even set up tunnels and things. So if, if you've got a mock utility or a mock tunnel, you're on site and you quickly need to put something in there, um, you can do that and you can check it. So um, Exodus was quite flexible that way. Right, so I've come to the end of this um, demo um, of how to use Exodus just to set up a tunnel and excavation problem and predict settlement. Now, I know in the current circumstances, uh, we've had a lot of people using Exodus from home. So um, I just wanted to put a couple of tips in there uh, as well, um, just to help you. So um, it's best to try and make sure you're running your analysis file locally, so not on a company or remote network. Um, so it just runs much smoother that way. Um, use the backup feature. So we have, um, through tools preference, you can basically choose to automatically back up your file regularly. Um, and that's um, something useful. Um, if you're using the most recent build, um, it really does help. So if you remember right at the start, I showed you how to get that information from the um, introduction. Um, but you can also go to help it about Oasis to get that information. And if you are a network license user, you can manage your license using our license portal. Um, there's a video online showing you how to do that. So if you need if for some reason you can't access a license, someone hasn't switched it off properly, um, you can use the license portal to deal with that. We provide um, a lot of free training 
um, and you know uh, support for people who are maintained and on subscription so um, the tutorial manual is available to you I think I showed you where that was on our website the user manual we've got tutorial videos as well so we would had a look at the user manual today uh, when I showed you um, the um, arc enabled feature um, and how to get information about re-entering corners we do have previous webinars that cover Exodus Pro um, and how stages um, can be set up and tips and tricks as well. And please email us if you need support or have any questions even following this webinar. Um, if you have specific questions about your analysis file, please send us your file and images. We will um, treat it with all full confidentiality and not share it with anybody. Um, and also please, um, please look up our training sessions. We are running a lot of online training sessions right now, and we've had a lot of successful feedback with regards to that. So if you're interested, let us know, please. So um, the objectives of today I want to cover as a summary was that um, I needed to introduce the methodology in Exodus, which I've done, and I went through a case study of how Exodus was used. Um, I've set up an analysis live, um, and I've also given you some shortcuts and tips um, along the way. So at the end of the month, we're going to um, do a session on building utility and rail damage assessment. So I'm actually basically going to use this base file set up a building, um, set up a utility, um, and set up a rail, um, uh, and um, then a, a rail track, and then run the damage analysis. So you can have a look at how um, how it's done. I'll also go through the theory with you, um, and I think that would be very useful for a lot of people. So um, I've come to the end of this particular session, um, this training session. I hope you've all found it really useful. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the things that I did were based on our tutorial manual. So please go go and try this and um, see how you get on. A, a video will be made available also of this session so you can share it with your colleagues. So it just goes for me to say thank you all for attending and are there any questions? <laughs>